She had a quiet upbringing in Woodstock, contributing to the family's bakery venture before devoting over 10 years to a career as an operating room nurse. Despite her dedication to nursing, her true love was always painting. Over time, she cultivated her artistic skills, earning international acclaim and high demand for her original pieces. Join us as we delve into the fascinating journey of Catherine Carnes Munn. I was born in a small town of Woodstock, New Brunswick on the St. John River Valley. There were six girls and one boy who was in the middle, and I was second to the oldest. When I was, I remember all the years growing up in, in Woodstock and uh, our whole family lived on the Holton Road, all my extended cousins, and, and so and there was a huge hill behind the house that we used to slide on and people from town would come out and slide on. And uh, so family was a big part of our life. It was a huge part. My father owned Carnes Bakery. And so when we would come home on the bus and you rounded the corner at, uh, onto the Holton Road, you could smell the donuts and the bread cooking. And we had to go but, you know, a lot of people really enjoyed that smell. But when we got off the bus, we had to go to work. We went into the bakery and we had to bag donuts and help with stuff like that. And then we went home for supper. And for breakfast every morning, we had toast. And we had toast and we had toast and orange juice. At noon hour, we always went to my grandfather's who lived uh, across the street from high school. That, that's when I was growing up a little later and had a big meal. Well, when we were little, we went there every Sunday, all of the webs, that side of the family, we went there after church and they had a beautiful breakfast and there would probably be 15 grandchildren, 15. Of course, we had seven and the rest had smaller families. But he took a great interest in me because I used to do a lot of drawing and he was a potato broker. So he had what you call um, uh, airline paper or whatever was uh, thin, thin. And he would let me draw on that and I could trace through this tracing paper. And so when I got to be about seven or so or eight, he took me down to the painting shop and he would start buying me paints. And then when I was in grade, when I got to be about 10 years old, he enrolled me in art classes. And this lady, she, uh, she had her painting classes every Saturday, and I loved it. So I did that until, well, probably until I was at least 12 years old. So after that, uh, uh, I did keep on painting. I... Everyone in high school would, uh, they were always babysat. I couldn't stay awake because we were up so early in the morning and we had to go to work after school. And uh, so I earned all my money, uh, extra money, by painting or by drawing. And so when I was maybe in grade 10, I was selling things then. And so... And I think a little bit of that selling came from the fact that we were in a in a uh, business family. Uh, I wasn't afraid to do it. And uh, so uh, this Mrs. Leach was her name. She started classes up again for adults. And so she let me come. I was only in grade 11, but she let me come. And uh, I did a painting, and then I did a, my first commission painting for uh, her name was Molly Trail. and was her homestead in Southampton. And she paid me $250. We're talking in 1964. I don't make that much now. <laughs> so, um, and then through nursing, I did the same thing. A lot of charcoal drawings and uh, I would do paintings. And then I started selling my paintings to uh, some of the doctors and some of the nurses. And then I started putting them in some art shows that were around the city, put on by UNB or the YMCA 
and things like that. So that was really my start into the actual selling of original paintings. When I started doing my reproductions of paintings, uh, my focus always seemed to go back to my roots growing up because uh, my uh, father's homestead was next door to our home and there were 13 children of which nine were women and the most of them lived in the homestead. Either they were uh, uh, never married or they were widowed. So it was going over there when I was, in, you know, probably I was only in grade seven or eight and you, you, you did the round of the hair, uh, doing the hair of, of all these women uh, for Sunday and and the worst was when you had to give a permanent. And then the tea bags, they saved all their tea bags. And so you would saturate the roots of their hair with the tea bags. That's why when you go, if you remember back when, when years ago, the women that had the yellow, white, their, their white hair was white, but it was yellow. That was tea bags. They, they dyed their hair with the tea. And, uh, and, uh, I can always remember them saying it was a, as I was going out the door, dear, you'll be rewarded in heaven. Well, I felt, you know, as years have gone by, I have been rewarded many, many times over. And it was really never a sacrifice doing this. It was just, uh, uh, it was just, you did it. You, it was something that you could do. Uh, so when I started doing my paintings, I started drawing on all these memories of mom making the quilts and saving the old shirts. Uh, uh, and uh, people from the bakery would give, her, give them the old flannel shirts or the old shirts and things, and she would cut patterns out of them and make quilts. The log cabin quilt was one, but it was little tiny squares about like this, and they were pieced all in the little sections. And... Uh, the visits to grandma, it was all, all the things. Our parents were very big on education. And with six girls and one boy, they wanted to make sure that every one of us had some sort of an education. I think it was because they weren't going to raise us the rest of their lives. So, but in those days, you didn't get to choose. They chose. Um, my sister used to teach us in the back of an old uh, box truck that had a pull-down world map. And she would have her pointer, and we would all sit on the benches, and she would point Asia, Africa, you know, South America, and stuff like this, and, we, and she would teach us. And so she was going to be the teacher. And me, because I was the hairdresser and all... Uh, very sympathetic towards, uh, my, I had more um, a compassionate uh, something in me or whatever that Sean, they decided that I would be a nurse. So they enrolled me in uh, VPH and they didn't tell me until about a week or so, maybe two weeks before. And they just drove me down and parked me and I remember being so lonely and I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to do it or not. Well, I, you didn't really think about those things. You just did them. And I thought, uh, I just remember being so lonely and everything, but uh, it turned out to be a wonderful experience. And again, I made my extra cash and stuff like this or extra money uh, through doing some paintings. When I came out, I worked in the operating room at both the uh, old VPH and the uh, Dr. Edward Chandler's Hospital for 12 years. And during that time, I, my my side painting career was really starting to escalate, and it was really grabbed at me like I wanted to do this. So I saved all my money for a year that I could save. And then I remember getting a a check from the government or something, I don't know what it was, but it was for $1,200. So I had this nest egg, which paid the lights and the mortgage and everything, my share of whatever I was paying uh, for a year. 
And being the operating room, I knew I could get back in because that was a, a trade. You, they were very hard to come by. So I gave myself one year and I hit the road. I did every art show, craft show that I could do. And I was then, Joey would be so ugly at me because I would make in one weekend what he would make in a month. And so he would, you know, but, he, he, you know, he, he, he wasn't really ugly. He couldn't believe that this could happen. So it would, it was very successful. And then I thought, well, I think I will do prints because I could not do enough original paintings for the people. So I uh, engaged a printing company here in Fredericton and Taylor Printing. And so I met friends during the shows in Halifax and uh, Cole Harbor, PEI, St. John, all of those shows, small shows that were open to the public. So one of them offered me to share his booth in Toronto. And that's the big time. That's where all of the stores come and buy wholesale. So everything that you buy in a store is bought at one of these trade shows, whether it be Atlanta, New York, Edmonton, Toronto is the big one. Uh, so, and it went really, really good. So I was doing those two shows a year and then I decided, well, I think I'll go to Edmonton. They're all going to Edmonton. So I just followed them to Edmonton. And then they went to Vancouver, then they went to Montreal, and then they went to Halifax, and now I'm really going. So, um, after about, say, three years of this, they contacted me from the uh, consulate in Boston to see if I would like to do uh, Nexus, which is a uh, trade with a trade organization with Canada and the United States. So I, I, I said, sure. So that got me picked up by an agent in Boston who did it, had showrooms in Atlanta and they had them in uh, Philadelphia, uh, New York. So now I'm in the United States. But when I mean in the United States, it was huge. So we, in, in, in that time, we had, we built a, a, a big, building we restored uh, 1860 Boss Gibson historical mansion or it wasn't a mansion then but a historical home that uh, probably one of the uh, the bosses from the from the Marysville mill lived in and we restored that and built a huge piece on the back and uh, within I would say like this started in 1989 and until when I first started we built the building in 1995 and by 2005, I had 40 employees in the building, and we had 40 agents on the road, and we were doing shows, and I was in an airplane flying from one city to the next, and how many times I would fly over to Brunswick, and would just, couldn't you just stop for a, an afternoon? And, but people, uh, I had to have people with me, uh, so we would have like three or four sales people that, that worked for me in the building that came with me, but they would come to Toronto and someone would meet them and I would fly from Toronto to Edmonton where I'd pick up another couple of employees. So I was always, uh, uh, two things that always came back home with one of these people was your orders that you were taking from the stores and your dirty clothes. And the <laughs> And the next group would meet you in Boston or New York, and they would have another suitcase full of clean clothes. Um, so it, uh, my husband left the Power Commission when we started in the U.S. market because it really got too much. And uh, so he retired and he came to work for me. So he did a lot of traveling with me. Um, the kids were starting to grow up a little bit then. And... Uh, but we managed to keep the three boys uh, well-fed, uh, loved. Uh, two were hockey players. We never, Joey never missed a game. One was a saxophone player and a piano player. And he went on to study uh, uh, music and drama in New York City for two years. Uh, Patrick is in Toronto. He works for an international travel 
company. He's a manager of, uh, they, uh, well, in order to, w the type of trips he sells are like $200,000. You rent an island and take 15 or 20 people, you know, uh, so it's, it's very exotic. Uh, and he plans the trip all out for these people and they want to see these underground caves and, and, uh, and Chris, he is now, he, he works for EXP Realty and he sells homes and he loves it. So they all sort of have that selling thing, which is not like a job. It's more of a, just a natural instinct. They love people. Um, oh, I guess. And they often cook and they learn that from me. <laughs> When we were uh, showing in the United States, um, uh, people who wanted to license your product were also at these shows looking for images and things that they could license. So we uh, licensed with a um, uh, calendar company with uh, doing uh, dishes and plates with our images on it, uh, uh, cans that had my images on them where they inserted their candles into it. And uh, it was, it was a, uh, it was a great little uh, extra. And then I thought, well, let's start producing some of my own. So the first thing we, I did was I wanted to do the dolls because there were six girls and one boy. I, myself and one of the staff that worked with me, uh, she, was a, a beautiful sewer. So we spent two or three weeks fabric fill running here, running there, everything, and we made gorgeous dresses. Have no patterns or anything. So you're not looking at someone else's product and trying to mimic it. And we did the first set and we did 500 dolls and 600 dolls, we did 100 of each and they sold out before the spring. So we did another set of the six girls and we took them, uh, made a bigger doll. And, uh, uh, and they, they, by then we were so excited. We were getting to some really fancy <laughs> crinolines and things like that. And each time you had to pick the faces. So they would send you the, uh, uh molds of the heads and you would have to pick between these hundreds of molds and so you, and hair. So, uh, uh, I asked them, can, like, if I give you pictures of their head, of their hair, can you match up something that's pretty close, you know? So they started matching up the hair to kind of look like the, the girls. And as time went on, I did my brother Pat. And, uh, but he held his foot to the ground. Uh, we, we, we got the samples back for Pat and he, and he, he was having nothing to do with this. And he was actually working with me then as uh, inter like an international manager. And so I caved and we didn't do it. And I still had the, I had two or three of the samples and I remember um, a man coming up to uh, buy the original of the painting that we took Pat from. And uh, we showed him the doll. Well, he almost passed out and he bought it. I, I said, I didn't want to sell it because I only had like three. And I wanted one for each of the kids. And uh, so he, he just cried. And so I said, okay, you can have it. There's a man from St. John, I remember for that now. So we went on then and we started putting my images on coasters. And that just went like crazy. Um, so we probably ended up with, uh, the biggest thing was when uh, one of the manufacturing companies came to me and said, uh, you should do replicas of the houses because all the houses that you are paintings you're doing are all historical. They're all, all landmarks. So I said, well, that sounds good. So he said, give me uh, uh, six of, uh, images of six of your paintings and I will have them done so you can have a look at them. So he, he brought them to the next show. I had the six paintings there, the six little porcelain houses, and they just stood in line to buy the painting and the, and we're talking 100,000 people going through these shows. They're massive. They're, um, I'd have to, it's probably 
four to five build, buildings that would be 30,000 square feet. And all the booths are like 10 by 20. Okay. They're massive. And they come from all over the world to these shows. So then I thought, well, I'm going to go for it. So I picked the, I picked, uh, the, uh, I, I, I started picking them out of the paintings I did. And I thought, I can't do that. I'm just not going to have enough houses. You know, I can't paint that many. So I started picking historical places like the, um, the government house, UNB, Castle Loma in Toronto. And so we, uh, uh, I picked a, a bunch of these, uh, Peggy's Cove, Lighthouse, you name it, I picked it. And uh, so I picked 12. We went to the show and we had a section of the booth set up with these just as the um, uh, porcelain lineups, wanting their own done. And I thought, now how am I going to work this? Because I hadn't even thought about that question. I thought of them each door buying individuals by maybe a dozen or six or something of 10 different pieces. But they, they wanted uh, the whole thing to themselves. Well, what am I going to do with Castle Loma? A beautiful, beautiful building. So on the right there on the fly, I said, well, you have to order 500 and you have to pay 50% up front. No problem. Wrote me out a check. And I'm going, holy smokes. So we, we started doing that. And then we had churches calling us, wanting their church done. And they did fundraisers. They would have, you always, I had to have 500 of an image done in order to get a price, certain price. Um, so the churches started buying. Then stores started buying specific landmarks uh, like Signal Hill. They didn't want anyone else to have it, so they bought the whole 500. So over the course of the next, so I, you know, I look back at these things and I cannot believe these things happen because, uh, I mean, I made that decision right on the slide, right on the fly standing in that massive showroom. Massive, uh, oh, it's not a showroom, it's like, you know, 30,000 square feet, and it worked, it went. In the end, after about six or seven years, we had done over 400 individual reproductions, and every one of them had 500 to begin with, and some of them that were in my collection, the ones that I chose that went with the paintings or ones that I kept for myself, we probably sold I would say there would be close to 80 or so of those. We probably sold 2,000 of each. So the numbers were astronomical. And then we get into Christmas ornaments with the little things. Well, if you can do them little, you can do big, you can do them small. And someone said, do wind chimes. So we did the wind chimes with them. And then can you, you know, big wind chimes, little wind chimes. And Joey, well, a woman came in one day and she was showing me her cable knit sweater and it was always oh, beautiful handmade Irish knit and she had she had made it and uh, Joey just happened to uh, be walking by and he says oh for God's sakes don't show her how to knit <laughs> she'll own a factory you know in a year she'll have a factory but Joey had a really sly sense of humor and he, he just the woman just stood there shocked and, um, and I said well you know you never know <laughs> So that's sort of how my life went on. We've had some tough times. In 1995, we lost our son, our middle son, Tim. And that was the most devastating thing that ever, ever happened to anyone. So my kids were, uh, Chris was uh, huge into hockey and Tim played. He was a, played for FHS and he was a great little player. And Chris and Timmy both played on the same team. And so he died right after he graduated, just uh, just a few months. And so I had, before he graduated, I, and I was already doing uh, money, uh, things to raise money for the hockey. And so I came up with the idea, I said, if I did a rival team playing hockey, 
and we did uh, 500 prints and we sold them at $75 each, uh, uh, they could raise quite a bit of money while they were, sports investment were blown away. A lot of them said, oh, you could never do it, never sell it. And a lot of them said, sure, sure, sure. And so I did it. We sold the, I think there were 750 in the first batch at $75 each. And we sold them in three months. So, and all of the money went to Frederick Sports Investment. At that time, they were also uh, equipping kids with some uniforms, or not uniforms, but hockey equipment that they couldn't afford. Uh, so, a year or so later, I thought, you know, one of them said, you should do another one. And I said, well, I'll do another one if you're sports investment people, if you can organize those people that you had the last time because they put a humongous effort into organizing the people to sell that second one. The first one was uh, Leo Hayes and FHS on Waterloo Row. The second one was uh, UMB in St. Thomas. And I did it uh, with the uh, old arts building in the background. And uh, they had lost a player, I can't remember his name. He was electrocuted um, in an accident and he was Jeffries, Mark Jeffries. And so I put him in it and uh, well, with, with permission from his parents and everything. And so we did 500 of that one and it, three or four or five months, it was gone. And then we lost him. And so I didn't really do too much all of 95 and 96. I could, couldn't even hardly get out of bed. Uh, but uh, we had so many friends and so many people we've met on our life journey along the way that sort of just drug me through it. And uh, they came, uh, they said, uh, someone suggested, you know, you should do one for Tim. And so I said, great, that's great. So I took it and put it called Pond Hockey with Tim and I put it with the backdrop of the gallery that we had renovated and our house was just one up from that. And um, I took all of his friends and the parents brought their pictures of them, of the kids, their kids in the hockey uniforms. And I have Timmy in it as a, as, as he was in, 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 at 19. And then uh, as he was as a little um, player when he was only probably a seven or eight, his girlfriend, his dog, <laughs> Uh, pictures of the kids sliding down the hill, which were actually, Patrick is there. Uh, he didn't play hockey, but I have him on a toboggan. I put his uh, uh, 1992 uh, tracker in the background, his truck, and we sold all of those. And that I didn't do any more after that. I, uh, uh, I thought, you know, we, we did well with it. And I think it was probably $250,000 in the end that we'd raised for it. Uh, and that goes on as a perpetual scholarship. They give three scholarships out each year. Uh, <clears throat> so anyone in sports, doesn't matter where you're from, is you're in New Brunswick, uh, it doesn't matter what sport. It can be golf, hockey, baseball, it doesn't matter. I've also done a lot of uh, um, paintings and things that I've given. Uh, like in Newfoundland, I can remember doing Brigus in Newfoundland and giving... Uh, giving them all of those so they raised uh, the money to restore the Hawthorne house. And uh, I, do, I donate an original every year for the uh, my grandson's hockey teams. And uh, I've, uh, we were donating probably over 200 pieces a, a year at the gallery of prints and things like that. And uh, it got it got to a, a point where it was really hef coming up there where people were asking the curling club wanted it for their ladies end of the year thing so we had to say uh, where we had to drop back down to health and education things that were raising money for health or education but uh, it's it, we've always done uh, a big share I remember uh, years ago Joey wanted to do the breakfast program at the 
uh, for the kids growing up in the, in the Alexander Gibson school down here. So he said, we, we can't go because we're on the road. But they had a good PTA there and everything. So we bought all the stuff and, and, uh, I always felt guilty that all I was doing, you know, or Joey and I were doing was giving the money for this stuff. And, uh, we opened it up to ev uh, uh, everyone in the school. Did, you, 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 we didn't want this kids to feel like they went there because they didn't have any breakfast. I said, my kids were the first ones out the door with no breakfast in their mouth. Uh, so, Everybody went. So you always went to school and there were lines of women and toasters all lined up and you just flip, flip, flip with the toasters and the bread and the boxes of juice and you went through. So, I mean, probably over 200 kids a day ate breakfast there. When I finished my career and I retired, I sort of laid back for a few years, but the itch was still there. So I started painting again. And I uh, uh, contacted a, a gallery, or I was actually in St. Andrews, and I went in and I asked him at Serendipin if, if he would like to have, if I could show my originals there. So he was totally excited about it. So I only show in one gallery, but in the last two years, I've probably sold at least 150 paintings last two and a half years there. So it's all I can do just to keep that one going. And uh, I really enjoy it. I do some commission pieces. And also for the last uh, few, few years, I've been teaching the natives actually for about 10 years um, at both Woodstock, Kingsclear and uh, St. Mary's. And uh, it was uh, a seniors, it was actually for drug and rehabilitation and mental health and that sort of thing. But it seemed to be all just, uh, it, it seemed to be a lot of seniors that were coming. So we w we ended up with about 16 people in the classes and that, that went pretty well for 10 years. So COVID put us out of um, Woodstock but then uh, uh, I kept on with Kingsclear and St. And St. Mary's. So I do one day a week at those two places. I enjoy the culture. I enjoy the women and the men. Uh, it's, uh, they're lovely people. Their culture is deep. Uh, and their traditions are something that I don't seem to see in, uh, we, I mean, family is the tradition, but their family is the, the, the whole community. And so they have rituals and things that they do, which I really enjoy. So this year I started teaching some classes of my own here at the house. And I'm loving it. So we have six women that come on Mondays and on Wednesdays. And we paint for four hours. We stop and have a little lunch. And uh, it's it's... It's almost like I remember my mother playing bridge every Thursday night for 50 some years. It feels like mom's uh, bridge party coming to her house because she always made the desserts and the sandwiches without the crusts. And uh, so that's where I am right now. I'm still providing uh, paintings for Serendipin and um, and doing my art classes with Kingsclear and St. Mary's and my classes two days a week here at home. <laughs>